I would like to welcome all of you to the second of third of three talks in the practicum speaker series this spring semester at the University of Colorado in Boulder. My name is Martha Russo and I have the honor of orchestrating the speaker series, which is made possible by a generous donation from a CU Fine Arts alumni, Brian Morgan, who resides in Denver, and also the support from the Art and Art History Department. And tonight's broadcast is technically made possible by Kirsten Stoltz, who is the coordinator for the CU Visiting Artists and Scholar Program, and Ben Herstrom, our video technician from the CU Visual Resource Center. Many thanks to everyone who has made it possible to bring this generous opportunity to all of us, now in our fifth year of the series. Throughout this semester, our invited speakers discuss the trajectory and evolution of their art practice and give insights into how to consider forging a sustainable, fulfilling career and life in the arts. Tonight's guest is the most inspiring, Derek Velasquez. Derek was born in Lodi, California, um, an, a rich agricultural region south of Sacramento, and currently resides in Denver, Colorado. He, rec he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in both studio arts and art history in 2004 from the University of California in Santa Barbara, and his Master of Fine Arts degree from The Ohio State University in 2008. Derek has shown his multimedia sculptures and install installations in recent solo exhibitions at the Heron School of Art and Design in Indianapolis, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, Robichon Gallery, Pentimenti Gallery in Philadelphia, and the Black Cube Nomadic Museum in Englewood, Colorado. He has numerous curatorial projects. He's done numerous curatorial projects at MCA in Denver, Trestle Gallery in New York, and has upcoming exhibition at Gallery Ro Robertson Aries in Montreal. He was a 2017 recipient of the, of the prestigious Joan Mitchell Foundation Grant for Painters and Sculptors and a 2019 McDowell Fellow. Derek has served on the Denver Commission of Cultural Affairs in, and is currently on number, a number of nonprofit boards in Denver, including Tilt West, Union Hall, and Minerva Projects. And if that's not enough, Derek also runs Yes Ma'am Projects, an artist-run gallery in the basement of his Athmar Park home, and Friend of a Friend, a new project space in the Evans School, a mostly vacant schoolhouse in downtown Denver. Derek is represented by Robichon Gallery in Denver and Pentimenti Gallery in Philadelphia. Simply, Derek is a true Renaissance person. He's always impressed me with how many different things he's doing in, in the most elegant of ways, and he does it with absolute humility, smarts, and grace. So here, so here's how tonight will work. While Derek is giving his presentation, Please feel free to write questions in the comment area and we will have a Q&A at the end. Derek, we feel incredibly fortunate to have you here tonight to give us some insights into your art practice and musings about life, living the life of a creative. Thanks so much for, for coming and um, we'll launch right into your talk. Great. Um... Thank you to Martha uh, for having me give this talk and also um, the CU Department of Art and Art History. Um, it, Denver always has like a relationship with Boulder and you know, you get up here and you come down but to Denver every now and then it's always great to be invited to either come up for studio visits or any kind of interaction with um, such a great department uh, that serves the state uh, through arts via artists and students who integrate into uh, whatever communities they decide to. Um, I feel like I'd be a little bit remiss if I didn't at least touch on world events and the hope that this talk is, um, isn't just about art, but also about life and community. And when I say community, I mean 
yeah, the physical people that are around you and that you interact with, but community almost as a verb, not necessarily creating community, but something that is embodied even deeper than that. And that's kind of what I um, talk about in most of this lecture um, are these interactions and relationships that I've been able to build um, by showing up and being around, which I think is uh, something that I would tell to any young emerging or any artist kind of moving to the, uh, the region. That many things in the art world exist outside of the studio and even outside of the art world. Um, and for me, a lot of those things really link up. Um, the first thing that I kind of show is this image. Um, it's one that I've taken recently. I don't take a whole lot of kind of like self portraits or images, but I felt like this one would be necessary or um, just to kind of remember where I am at, at this point. Um, here, I'm, I'll talk about the space a little bit later, but um, God, I hope these people aren't watching, but I'm on the bill. I'm on the top uh, cupola of an old school building. That's probably, I don't know, 70, 80 feet up above the golden triangle in Denver. Um, and this is, I don't know, the way that I at least imagine myself kind of living my life as an artist and somebody who's been in Denver for about 13 years now. Um, I guess going back, going through a little bit how I ended up in Denver, um, it's not like unique or necessarily interesting, but I think it's important to kind of mention where I was at a very specific time <clears throat> and um, how I've think from my inside perspective, how I've kind of navigated um, the world and some of the projects that I'm doing. And I'll talk a little bit about my work kind of at the end. Um, so uh, like Martha said, I'm from California. I, I went to school in Santa Barbara for undergrad, took a couple years off before I went to grad school, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but it is now, I think about 13, 14 years ago when I moved to Denver. And I got to Denver um, with an MFA from Ohio State University, went to Columbus, and I kind of moved to Denver on a whim. It was really a process of elimination and um, of how I got to Denver, but I was looking for places to live uh, that weren't necessarily the Midwest and weren't the East Coast and weren't the South and weren't back in California. And um, I had one friend in Denver who really didn't know anything about the arts. It was also the recession, the beginning of the recession. So um, I feel like it was kind of a very interesting time to move anywhere, um, and especially Denver. So um, this is a slide of, so I, I was looking for places to live and I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna move to Denver. And I went on Craigslist, which was, you know, very useful then for connecting with people in whatever manner. And um, I think this, I reached out to, I mean, I think it says here, it's a uh, art scene in Denver. It must just been the art and artist section in uh, the Denver Craigslist. And um, I'll read just a little bit of this. I was basically asking like, what's the art scene like in Denver? And this guy was like, there's beautiful weather. Uh, relatively safe and clean, big enough to be an interesting place to live, good restaurants, culture, recreation, smart people, yet small enough to get um, get to know it, and more importantly, other artists as well. It's a forgiving place. If you come as a stranger, you would find it pretty accommodating place uh, to invent a life in. That said, if you're serious about putting that MFA to work and about building a viable art career, you really need to con uh, consider locating yourself to a major art market, which means for better or for worse, New York or LA. As a mid-career artist offering advice to a younger one, I'd point out that the art world is largely insular and geocentric. It's also difficult to access venues in major markets if you're looking, um, if you're not living in a major place. And this is an artist, Bill Stockman, who, um, so this was in 2008 when I sent this email out. Um, I would go on to meet him in 2014 at an opening at Guild Art Gallery. And I was like, um, hey, I sent you this email. And he's like, I remember that email. 
I told you not to move here. And so I ended up in Denver. Um, the, the first way that I even got in here, I mean, I, was, I felt like I was taking a bit of a leap moving here and not really knowing anybody. And I moved in, I was lucky again through Craigslist to find a house um, affectionately known as the art house or show pen. I was the first resident in it and it was owned and beginning just uh, operated by um, former CU MFA Boulder alumni, Don Fodness. I was the first resident to move in and I was one of the last ones to leave. I lived here for five and a half years. And as you can kind of see, it's one of these like Denver kind of craftsman squares. Um, basically there's no hallways in between any of the studios, but the first floor was designated as studio space. Um, everybody got their like, I don't know, 125, 150 square foot little space that was a living room, a dining room, um, and maybe like a small pre-room. And then everyone got to live in one of these rooms up top, um, three artists at a time. And um, my room was probably like 100 square feet and I had 150 square feet of studio space. And to me, this was a bit of a dream. Um, I was only paying $350 a month to live here, which sounds a bit absurd for Denver now, but um, up until 2014, when I finally moved out, I was also living in this house um, for the same amount. So that opportunity that was kind of both serendipitous and afforded to me by someone who's being generous um, with their time and energy and putting that risk to buy a house in the recession and just give it to artists was really amazing. And this is something that I would say to, uh, if any advice, I don't know, live, you don't have to live communally, but you know, try to live with friends and live cheaply. In this house, I got to live with some amazing, um, again, CU Boulder alum, alum, both undergrad and grad. This is John Geiger, um, I think graduated in 2010, 11. Um, he went on to go to Cranbrook, uh, to get his MFA, and now he's the head preparator at the Cranbrook Art Museum. So he is continuing on. This is Scott Raby, who graduated, I think, maybe 2009, 2008. He's now living in Denmark, and he's running some really amazing curatorial public programs there. And Zi Zhang, who's uh, now a full-time professor, I believe, at Utah State. And I got to live with these people and a whole number of other people, uh, one I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but that was very important to me, coming to a city where I didn't really know anybody. We could rely on each other in a way, um, even if I didn't know people and some people would move out and then I knew residents would move on in and I'd kind of be a manager of the house because I ended up living there for a number of years. But it was really important to me to throw myself into an environment where I don't know, there was some form of support system. We would go to openings together. We would go biking together. We would do, we became very close friends and we're still all really close friends from meeting them over a decade ago in a kind of strange, almost squat DIY art house. So what did this art house afford? Um, other than cheap rent, uh, eventually we cleared out one of the spaces and all of the residents who were living in the space got to organize exhibitions in this room. It was maybe 50 or 60 square feet. And um, there were three or four people living there at a time. And uh, each artist got three or four months out of the year to organize exhibitions. This is an exhibition I organized with um, one of the artists I was living with, Adam Milner, another CU Boulder alum. Um, and, you know, we basically just got to throw our ideas out there with relatively low stakes, but everything felt very high stakes to us. And those kind of stakes will probably change and fluctuate a lot of times. Some things will seem like they're the most important thing, um, whether it's you're graduating, whether you're having a thesis show, whether you're having your first show in a small artist run space to a museum show. That f and, and then sometimes it'll completely flip on its head and things that seem very small um, will take a priority. Um, but this really gave me 
the opportunity again to throw ideas on the wall, curate exhibitions that were conceptual, um, ones that were of friends, um, and some that were just of our stuff. So this is a small exhibition. It's all work that we got for free um, between Adam and I. Um, so there's like a Felix Gonzalez Torres, there's a Louise Lawler, um, and some other artists from Denver and, and kind of beyond. <clears throat> and this house was also not just, it wasn't just a space for us to live in. We had kind of freedom to, I don't know, uh, commune, we'll say. Um, I think this is an exhibition that Don Fonis actually organized. Um, so you can kind of see how many people are packed in these tiny spaces. And this was a lot of fun. There were, I don't know, probably 100, 100 plus people at this opening in general, kind of packing into the spaces of this very compact house. Um, there was a porch, so we we're hanging out on the porch. And this was really began to emphasize and lay a pathway for the way that I still prefer to ex uh, organize exhibitions. Um, a lot of people will say you go to art openings, you don't even look at the art. That's true, um, sometimes, a lot of the times. But also, um, it really is the environment in general um, that I get a lot of energy from, even though I've only learn to become somebody who is um, more social. I don't think I'm an extrovert, I'm probably still an introvert. And I get drained when it comes to doing openings or going to openings, whether they're my own or ones I'm uh, organizing or um, of people who I'm trying to support. But this is so much fun. Um, there's another alum, Tyler Beard, Amelia Carley in the back. Um, and again this this is this really set the tone for the years of how i still again organize exhibitions whether they're more institutional or whether they're not so i lived in chopin for five and a half years and um, i was a lucky enough to move into and purchase a house right before really the housing market in denver kind of exploded or I caught the kind of final frontier of what I think um, any kind of housing in Denver is, uh, the southwest side of Denver. It's Athmar Park. Um, I was able to buy a house and um, there was this basement that was unused for a long time. It was kind of grungy. That tile actually is asbestos. Um, there were single light bulbs coming from the middle of the room. I didn't even, for the first three years of living in that house, I didn't even store stuff in here. I wouldn't go down there. It would just be echoey and it would be actually kind of scary um, <clears throat> if I felt like I heard a sound. And um, I took a trip to Portland to see my friend James Knowlton and um, they were going to PNCA at the time. And we went to the closing of a exhibition space that was in a garage. It was from somebody who had gone to PNCA, uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art before, and it was their final show. And James didn't really know them all that well, but we went and we hung out and, you know, we were just drinking. And I was like, I think I could do this. You know, I have a garage. Um, there's the potential I could open a space. And James was like, you should give me the first show. I was like, we'll do it. Um, this is like late, mid, late 2016. Um, and then the opportunity came to, well, I call it an opportunity and a call to open this gallery space. Um, at the end of 2016, um, the ghost ship fire happened in Oakland, California. And, uh, and that tragedy not only killed 40 people, 40 plus people in a fire, but it also allowed cities all across the country to um, raid or inspect artist run DIY live workspaces. Denver was completely affected and it still hasn't recovered from that. And it bums me out. Um, Rhinoceropolis, uh, Juice Church, um, even, even our studio space, uh, Tank Studios, which has 
um, relatively up to code, nobody's living in there, got inspected in ways that were almost devastating, um, over-inspected, and the city and the fire department was flexing its muscle, to which there's a lot of, you know, you can say what it did or what the intent of it was before, whether it was safety or whether it was for other reasons. Regardless, it definitely devastated the um, very fun DIY punk spaces. And I figured if I could open a space that is my house that I owned and it was inviting people to, then nobody could shut down my event or my party. So again, you can kind of see, again, I, I felt like that was a call to use the space that I had the privilege to run and live in um, to offer up to other exhibitions at a time that was in great need. So it's two spaces. There's like this little kitchen you can kind of see in the back, and then there's a back space. Again, it was pretty dingy. Um, I spent about a month or two fixing it up. Um, and doing floor, doing subflooring, plumbing, electrical, lighting, paint, wall repair, um, into making it a perfect little space. Um, all the spaces that I ever want to run are manageable, both in size and expectation and stakes. Um, <clears throat> and here are just a couple of exhibitions that I did. Um, I did about only four exhibitions a year because you can only have people in your house so many times. Um, and at the same time, um, I was trying to kind of figure out how much I wanted to curate things, how much I just wanted to offer solo exhibitions to artists who I was looking at and weren't even necessarily my friends or just more kind of like fun exhibitions. And the fun ones were the most fun. Like this is the thing that I'll say, you know, um, that this whole first, again, the whole first part of the lecture is like, get out there, turn any space you can into a gallery um, and people show up, even if it's only your friends, um, even if it's not about the art, that is totally fine. Give yourself some organization tools, figure out how it's done, learn from even like tiny mistakes for um, things that seem like they're at big stakes. Um, this is an exhibition I did. This is the last one that I've done um, at Yes Ma'am Projects. And it was called Taylor B because I happened to know four artists all with the name Taylor B. Um, and they had all lived in Denver at some time. And I remember being at a bar and saying, oh, I'm doing a studio visit with Taylor. And they're like, which one? And I was like, Taylor B. And they're like, which one? And this was five or six years ago when this conversation happened. Um, and this exhibition, Taylor B, uh, happened in June of 2020. So or late June, early July. Um, so I felt that because I have a backyard, uh, people could come and hang out in the backyard and go into the gallery one at a time and, and have some levels of safety um, from COVID and really still the beginning of the pandemic. So this is Taylor B, um, Taylor um, Bratches, Taylor Barbosa, um, Taylor Boylston, and then Taylor Balkasin. Um, some of them moved on. The only one who lives here now is Taylor Barbosa. Um, but as you can kind of see, it's just an opportunity to show artists and throw right, still throw ideas in there in potentially a more formalized way. This is three of the four artists they could make it. Um, Taylor Boyson couldn't make it because she was in LA at the time. Um, but again, it was just the opportunity to bring some friends back together. I love bringing people back to Denver because a lot of people leave for various reasons, whether it's uh, getting too expensive or the opportunities are too great in other cities. Um, while Denver is a tr it's, remains both a transplant city and a transient kind of city, in the way that uh, people flex in and out of Denver. Um, this is another exhibition I did <clears throat> um, that was called Window Wells. Um, because it's in the basement, it's garden level. Uh, there are window wells uh, in every single one of the rooms, including the kitchen. And the idea was to clear the space out so there was no art on the actual interior walls, but then have people do installations in the window wells. 
Um, this was such a fun exhibition. Everyone, almost all the artists decided to light their works or, you know, use light in their works to emanate and light the gallery. And it had this incredible feel um, in the space. It almost felt like a house party, just a house party, honestly, uh, with like a single lamp in the corner. Um, so there's a couple artists here, Marsha Mack, who now lives in Columbus, Kate Casanova, who is um, professor of sculpture at DU, uh, Sarah Bowling, who's now getting her MFA at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so I really just wanted to change the, the context of the space. I remember when opening the space, I was like, oh, should I cover up all the piping and all the vents and stuff? And I took advice from somebody who said, just let people know they're in a basement, but they're in a gallery. Um, so this show, I think, exemplified it the best of all the shows that I did at Yes Man Projects. Um, and it was a party. Um, it was so fun, like to invite people. And and another thing about this, this, uh, this show is like, really none of, the artists didn't really know each other that well. Um, and I was able to bring together artists who, you know, uh, were maybe friends or acquaintances and put them in a show and bring all of their communities and all of their friends to the show and just celebrate in kind of like what was a basement party that was celebrating art uh, and also allowing people to kind of think of a context of egress that exists, how to get in and out of a space, these windows where you're kind of below looking up or you're on ground level looking down. Um, it was a really kind of fun show to both do. Um, and also, again, a really great kind of gathering of a lot of different communities. And I feel like that's part of my purpose, especially in post pandemic. Um, uh, which I'll talk about it in a little bit here. Um, another the way that Yes Ma'am started, um, it was a gallery second, but it was an artist grant first. Um, and it was an artist grant in which I, I took sales of one of my uh, artworks, saved it, and I gave it away as an anonymous grant um, to somebody in the kind of regional community. I took nominations. I sent out those nominations to um, an outside curator. I tried to remove myself from it. I didn't announce that it was me until maybe like a year or two into it. Um, that idea of anonymity was really kind of important to me because I know <clears throat> in Colorado how, let's just say it, like desperate artists are for grant money or any kind of recognition that you are living as an artist and that it's important. Um, some people suspected that there was like some kind of nepotism that I was just give it, somebody was just creating an award to give it to their friends. Uh, but uh, again, I wanted to remove myself. I wanted to be as ethical as possible. Um, and this is kind of the way I tried to remove myself from it. And, you know, it kind of became strange because the first person to win the award um, was somebody who I also lived with at Chopin in the art house, um, Adam Milner, again, another CU art and art history uh, alum. Um, and he was the first person to win it and it was all through nomination and sending it to a, a curator who I'd been able to meet who was teaching out at Hunter College in New York City. And he chose Adam's work, um, who I hope that, you know, everybody who's here, I hope that they show this in like, you know, most classes here. He was just featured on the format that Art 21 is now taking where they're doing a few more shorts, uh, short films about artists. Um, and Adam who now lives in New York City and has kind of gotten a lot of amazing attention is just a wonderful artist. Um, is Art 21, it's like one of those things that you always kind of like they always show them all the way back from the 2001 series with like Ann Hamilton and that Adam would have the opportunity to be profiled here is like really incredible and such a kind of boon for himself and for um, CU as a program. So some other things that I've been doing, um, again, more of kind of these ideas surrounding um, community, community, creating community or just servicing 
the city that I, I'm that I live in. Um, I'm really beginning to find that I'm measuring more of my success by how I can help other people gain whatever level of success they uh, success that they desire, um, and that goes into teaching uh, curatorial and exhibition opportunities, um, or like a kind of program that was kind of a fledgling or just like a off the cuff program that I ran out of my basement called Deep Crit. Uh, it was an experimental crit session where I um, took applications for artists to uh, take part in a three week session where I would give them hopefully graduate level critiques um, without them having an MFA or even a BFA. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't let people who had had major exhibitions at like commercial galleries uh, no MFAs um, and and that because I really wanted people who were committed to the city and were really committed to art in a way that go, that went beyond academics um, and trying to give them constructive criticism, probably that they hadn't felt since graduating an undergraduate program. And so here are some of the artists in the first Deep Crit program. Um, I like uh, there's two spaces in the gallery, so I let one of them set up in one and one in the other, and we'd spend an hour plus just talking about their work, whether they were works in progress um, uh, or whether they were finished works. And this idea kind of came out of um, Michael Jones McKean and Julie Gross's program uh, assembly, which they were holding out in New York City. And I wanted to bring that to my scale uh, into Denver. Um, so yeah, here's just some images of the critiques. And so I used to teach adjunct at a number of institutions. I taught at CU Boulder for a year. I taught at DU. I taught at Metro State for about eight years. And while I was very lucky and fortunate to um, move into and always kind of be a full-time artist for a very, you know, in addition to teaching, I was able to um, remove even that uh, time given to teaching to being a full-time artist and running galleries. And, um, but I still, crave offering that mentorship and giving it to people who are really there for it. So that's kind of what this program was. And as time went on, I, uh, the pandemic hit actually. So uh, deep crit happened in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic and I was like, this is great. I'm, I, I'm getting six people together. Almost none of the people knew each other that well. Um, and creating this, like, hopefully this small group of friends, you know, who can work with each other and give each other critique. And then the pandemic hit. So I doubt they really talked to each other or communicated for that whole year. Um, and coming out of the pandemic, well, not really, in about March of 2021, um, I hadn't really done any more shows at um, yes, ma'am projects. And I wanted to open a gallery that was outside of my home. Like I was just telling the, pra uh, the practicum class before, like you can only have parties at your basement house so many times a year. Um, and in addition to, aside from the openings, many people weren't visiting the gallery because it was in a home location. And so I started to look for other spaces to open a gallery outside of my home. Um, I found one space and it fell through. It was down on South Broadway by where my studio is. And then I was lucky to, it, it got my juices going enough to look for another space. Um, just look online, look on LoopNet, look at like real estate ads. Um, and I found um, an amazing space. Um, I kind of can't even believe that I have the opportunity for a short amount of time to open a gallery. And I wanted to open this space, um, name it friend of a friend. And it opened in April 2021. So it was still pre vaccination. But the building was large enough and almost empty enough, where I felt people could with masks at the time, um, go spread out in these massive hallways. And then also, um, there's a rooftop deck, which I'll show in a little bit where people could just commune. I just really felt, again, the need hopefully crossing our, we were crossing our fingers coming out of the pandemic that we would be able to have exhibitions and have openings again. 
And I just knew so many artists that also, I mean, most artists had their shows canceled, delayed, completely scrapped. Um, and there are also what I found out a lot of artists actually moving to Denver in the pandemic who were like, um, I'm, I'm moved here and now I, I can't meet anybody because we can't meet anybody. I think during the pandemic, I met five people like the first year. And I was like, it was almost driving me nuts. Like, again, I'm not like, I am a social person now. Um, but the lack of ability to meet people was something that I was really craving and missing. And I wanted to create that for other people in Denver as well. So I found uh, a space in this old 1904 school building. It's called the Evans School. And um, the building had basically been abandoned. Someone owned it and abandoned for about 30 years. Um, a few things happened in it. And actually right behind it is the parking lot of the Denver Art Museum. So it's not, not it's, it's a prominent building. And the thing about this building, I feel like I'm one of the first like kind of like artist artists to be in there who's part of the community. Whenever I would invite people over, I'd be like, oh, it's by the dam. They're like, what building? I was like, it's the giant freaking school building. And they're like, oh. And it was a building that was invisible to people because they ha had no access to it. And kind of opening a little bit of access to this building has been incredibly fun and incredibly fruitful, not just for my own um, exhibition organizing practice, um, but also um, I think for the community in general. This is the first exhibition we did and I like to work with people I've worked with before. So this exhibition was called Deeper. And what I did is I took a year after the Deep Crit program, I checked in to see what they were up to a year later and I was like, we're having an exhibition. You're the first exhibition. What do you have? And some of them had been working very continuously and all of them had work ready to go. And again, one of the really kind of fruitful things that happened in Deep Crit a year later is almost every single artist that we gave critique to um, at Yes Man Projects incorporated some of the suggestions we gave them into the work. And that just like really warmed my heart in a way that um, I don't know, just made it feel like the effort was worthwhile. Um, so this is the first exhibition in the space. The space is pretty small. I, again, like I said, I like manageable spaces. It's, um, it is, uh, about 270 square feet. I did lighting. I painted the walls. I covered up holes with drywall. I did all this labor myself. Um, here's another exhibition. Artist Grace Kennison, <clears throat> who graduated with, from an undergrad at CSU a few years ago and um, gave her kind of her first solo show in Denver. Um, she's kind of picked up by Visions West now. Um, and then I did an exhibition in the summer called Schools Out, where we invited 30 artists, 32 artists. Um, and I have to add that I am not doing this all by myself. I'm running it uh, with my co-director, Lauren Hartog, who is a gallery manager, assistant to the gallery director um, at University of Denver's Vicki Mirren Gallery. So we curate and organize these exhibitions together. And we invited 32 artists to um, display in this almost modified salon style. And this is really fun too. Um, we reach out to artists that we don't know. And, and that is one of my favorite things about organizing exhibitions is, is maybe reaching out to people I don't know that well. Um, but I can kind of glean either from social media or glean from something like the like the name of the gallery, the namesake of the gallery, friend of friend works. Um, so yeah, we invited a bunch of artists and we threw a party. There were people in the middle of this opening hugging each other who hadn't seen each other in a year. And it was a really incredible experience to, again, um, open up this opportunity and introduce artists to other artists once again. Like I said, there's this dope rooftop deck. Um, I don't know. It's like basically three stories up in the summer and late spring, summer, fall. Most people go and hang out there when it's warm. Um, I have the gallery space, I think, through June, at least, of 2022. So come hang out on the roof. Um, everybody's invited. We're on Instagram. You can find uh, information there. 
Other cool things about this building, there's an auditorium. I'm kind of like a, become an avid karaokeer, um, not just going to places, but also putting on karaoke events. Um, so this auditorium was kind of amazing. It's the it's in the school building, and um, I had free reign of it for a while. So even pre-vax, I'd have five friends spread all about, and we'd go, we'd be masked, and then we'd go up and sing, and I'd have like little microphone condoms for every single person. Um, I also commandeered um, Levitt Pavilion when it wasn't being used for concerts and just set up a mobile speaker and invited friends to kind of project out into, um, I don't know, the non-audience, the random person like walking their kids through the park. Um, but this is part of my, again, I feel like karaoke and art have this communal aspect where you kind of take a risk and you put yourself out there. Um, and I kind of relate those in a lot of ways. This was kind of my first public ideas of, of uh, karaoke on a road trip. I am still living with your ghost, lonely and dreaming of the West Coast. Well, I don't want to be your downtime. I don't want to be your street. Yeah, so this is me doing karaoke on a road trip for... Um, an exhibition I had in Philadelphia, and um, someone just gave me the idea that I should be doing this at uh, restroom stops in Kansas. But I just pulled off at a gas station um, and kind of did this, and it became like my break um, from driving, and also just became, in some ways, a little bit of performance during a pandemic driving across the country, which was like wholly interesting experience as well. Um, and I stopped off in uh, Massachusetts where I got to run into another CU alum, uh, Camille Breslin, who just finished her MFA at Hunter and now lives in New York. Um, so I'm gonna run through a little bit of my work very quickly. Um, I've organized this, geez, these last slides of just a way of, of um, cause yeah, I mean, I, I actually prefer to give these kind of lectures right now where I'm talking about how to get people together having exhibitions in your basements, in your backyards, in your living rooms. I really wish Denver had more apartment galleries and more places to show up. If you have a show in your apartment or your basement or your backyard, or as Martha said, your bathroom, um, I will show up because um, I love showing up to things and I uh, love supporting stuff. Um, but getting a little bit into my studio practice, uh, this is the exhibition that I was driving across the country for um, in Philadelphia at Pentimenti Gallery in, in uh, September 2022. And, you know, not, I'll talk a little bit of just about the work. Um, I'm known for this vinyl series kind of on the left. Um, they're wall sculptures. It's uh, multiple strips of sometimes brightly colored vinyl or monotone, light, white to gray to black uh, vinyl strips that um, are piled on top of these wood forms and eventually kind of like accumulate into these kind of floating sculptural um, pieces that I, I kind of relate to the physical body in a way where um, you can kind of see how they curve. It might be, again, like the, the bone um, of your shoulder with muscles and tendons and skin on top of it, and it begins to round out. But I um, a lot of other work I do really looks at the history and context of materials and imagery and ideas of luxury and ideas of hierarchy. And some of my works are sometimes trying to subtly and sometimes not so subtly obliterate those hierarchies. So I work with architectural trim mold molding, which is ornamentation um, that might be at, like the Palace of Versailles or classic Greek Roman friezes. Um, it has a history of uh, obviously through Western culture, um, Eastern culture, um, but I'm really focusing more on the kind of Western from Roman to French to European and over to um, American kind of architecture. And actually these slides that I'm gonna show are kind of about the work, but it's really more about what my studio looked like at that time. Um, because, you know, I think 
whether you're an artist in the studio, whether you're a student potentially graduating from your MFA or your BFA or anything, your studio is a space that not a lot of people get to look into and they don't get to see what the studio looked like right before an exhibition. So I'm going to go through some slides right now really quickly that are, um, that are more specifically about what my studio looked like right before an exhibition. So you can kind of see, um, this was at McDowell, which is an artist residency in Southwest New Hampshire, where I got my own little cabin, kind of worked for it a month in the dead of winter in 2019. And um, you can kind of see those collages that were in this other slide. Um, and some of these paintings, I'm not a painter, but I wanted to attempt painting. I wanted to throw myself into something new during this residency. So there's a, a few paintings I was working on, a few small sculptures, this architectural trim molding that I was casting in silicone and turning into knots to almost like cartoon this, this thing that is meant to represent money and structure and power. Um, but yeah, here's kind of what my studio looked like. And I was just trying a lot of new stuff, which I think is always important. Um, especially for me, because the vinyl series is my bread and butter. It's legitimately how I make my living. Um, but I'm definitely interested in making some other things and finding ways to incorporate, integrate, or completely brush against those is uh, something that I have the urge to do while making. Um, so I did back-to-back -back residencies. I did one at, uh, I did McDowell first, and then I did Mass Mocha, um, which is in Northwest Massachusetts. And um, so you can kind of see the ideas that were happening and the exhibition that kind of came out of it. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I mean, my work is pretty solid and pretty serious, but I do kind of like to poke fun at things a little bit. Um, you can kind of see um, this is my studio right before I had an exhibition at concurrently at the MCA in Denver and also at Robichon Gallery. Um, and again, I'm taking architectural trim molding. This piece in the back is a large ceiling medallion, which would normally be on the ceiling, and a chandelier would hang from it. I kind of painted it with this gradient and treated it like a target dark bo uh, dartboard. So I was throwing darts across the studio and hitting them, uh, or hitting this target um, from quite a distance. And this is that exhibition at Robichon Gallery. And you can see how everything was somewhat a prototype and then eventually became scaled up into the exhibition it is. And I think that's just like really important to show like how maquettes happen, how something you're making in the studio isn't always the final thing, um, the final artwork that you'll make. And sometimes you can think bigger when you have the opportunity to think a little bit larger. Again, this is at uh, Robichon Gallery. Um, and again, all those like weird trim tubes and all these little zigzags that I was making and collages were directly coming out of the studio. Um, this is a, my exhibition I, I concurrently had at um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. Um, the title of it was um, Obstructed View. And what I was really thinking about was architecture and materials that existed in Denver not just gentrification, but the buildings that were actually the monoliths of gentrification, aside from developers um, having their part in it, but the actual buildings. So I was looking at luxury apartments, what I call crap luxury apartments, um, faux modernism. They're meant to emulate Bauhaus, kind of like modernist style, but they're just made of the worst materials and painted the worst colors. Um, and I was looking at a lot of those materials, like cement, concrete, um, plywood, and kind of trying to analyze that and, and create almost like a, a sculpture and installation of these, of, of some of these things that uh, I felt related to or talked about them without directly talking about buildings. So this is just a, like a huge compilation of, of pieces that I've used before and also um, completely new pieces. And kind of the culmination of it was this, uh, was the Oculus that went from the first floor into the lower level of uh, the MCA, which if you've been there, you look down and there's this black painted sprung floor. And this um, Oculus is about 24 feet by 12 feet. <clears throat> and I covered it in 16 different trim moldings and painted it gold. 
And typically you would look above you and there would be a trim molding and there might be a fresco or a painting above you looking into the heavens. I thought I'd kind of flip that on its head and um, you'd be looking into more of this black abyss in this beautiful building that was designed by David Adjai uh, that's completely modern, all white cube for the most part. And I wanted to reintroduce something that seems like of a bygone era, this architectural trim molding. And you would never see gold trim molding in really any modern contemporary building. And I thought that that kind of juxtaposition of both material and scale and color and flipping it on its head <clears throat> would, would be um, was something that I was much after in my kind of like overarching and kind of uh, more niche concepts. So yeah, here's my studio in more messy times. Um, I don't know, I just have a lot of stuff kind of going on. And this is currently what my studio looks like now as I'm preparing for a show in Montreal and um, in a show uh, in Brooklyn later in the summer or later in the spring. Um, this is pretty early on. This is probably 2013 at Tank Studios. Um, again, a studio space I co-founded um, when I had kind of this more narrow space. And this was me preparing for one of my first solo booth art fairs, which is something that I do participate in um, and can participate in. And um, you can kind of see these things on the side that are these structures and some of these vinyl pieces that make them directly in to uh, this booth I had at Volta in New York in 2013 with my gallery Pentimenti. Um, so yeah, it's, you can, again, I, I just really want to show like direct studio, a lot of studio shots. It's like very cleaned up and the artist is kind of like standing there and it's really staged. I don't know. I like taking photographs when nothing is staged and when I have scraps and garbage all over the place. Um, yeah. Um, these might be the, first, the final slides I have um, of my studio space. Um, this is probably, I don't know, maybe three years ago. Some And a lot of things exist in my studio for a long time and I'll throw them out or I'll put them in a show. That black and white zigzag or that black zigzag in the back was probably there for three years and I finally put it in a show or I remade it. Um, it went into the Robichon show in 2017. Um, but I always come back to these vinyl pieces and, and um, I want them to exist in the same space as a lot of my other things that I'm working on as well, because they do. I make them all in the same studio. And while I think <clears throat> some people would like to keep them separate, I want to integrate them, even if I have to force them. Sometimes you have to force things. That's just the way things work. Um, so here's some of those pieces, again, at Robichon. And... Yeah, that's kind of the end of the formal presentation of, of how I, I don't know, I guess the way that I just both live my life and how I try to make it as both an artist, exhibition organizer, and a person who creates and tries to make create uh, opportunities for other people within the region and outside of the region. So thank you for listening in. Oh, Derek, that was fantastic. Wow. Amazing breadth and depth of work and, and just all the different practices that you have going on all of the time. Um, you know, it really makes me think of Joseph Boys and his idea of the social sculpture. And I feel like you do that in so many different ways, whether it's, you know, opening up your space in your basement, the, the school building looks incredible. But I'm just so impressed, and I've always been impressed with you in terms of your just sheer generosity of getting people together and giving people opportunities. Um, so I, I guess one question I had for you is, how, do you get tired? Um, yes, this is a... I'm very good at sleeping, um, <laughs> not at normal hours. Um, I'm kind of a night owl. And this, 
this became exacerbated over the pandemic when there was nothing going on. Yeah. I was going to sleep at like 6.30 in the morning. I was, the sun's up. I guess it's time to go to sleep waiting for the next day. Um, no, there's like the, there's the Hulk meme where he's like, from uh, Avengers where he's like, my secret is I'm always angry. And I found the meme that's like, how do you fall asleep on airplanes or anywhere? It's kind of my superpower is that I'm always tired and can always sleep. But <laughs> another thing, like right now, I, again, I love kind of giving this kind of lecture. Um, and I feel super invigorated for a lot of reasons. A, because I feel like Denver is a tough place to make as an artist. So I want to give opportunities. But also I feel like I slept for a freaking year. Like <laughs> I didn't use that energy for a year. And, and in part opening friend of a friend was really amazing because when I opened the gallery, I, it was, it's by appointment only because it's private. I, people would make appointments to see the gallery and to see the exhibition, but we just hung out for an hour and I hadn't seen these people in the real in maybe a year. And so that, I just realized that that was starting to give me energy again. Um, so yeah, that's the answer. I, I sleep plenty just at some odd different hours. And, um, but again, I, uh, I, I feel like I have that energy currently. Fantastic. I really, um, it was so insightful to see all your studios in different permutations and, and then just to see how the work evolves. And I, I feel like, you know, the advice you gave our students today during class, like every, when you left, everybody was sort of a buzz with your, your just, your sort of wise and again, always very gracious and humble advice. And I, I, you know, I can't thank you enough for inciting that in our students today. And Derek's visit continues with some one-on-one -on -one crits that will happen on Thursday, which will be, that are always incredibly impactful to, you know, our young artists getting ready to get out of the CU nest here and beyond. But I just, um, just think it's so admirable, all of the different hats you wear all of the times. I, you know, we didn't talk any too much today in class or, or in your talk here. How, how do you feel your board work um, invigorates your, your sundry practices? Yeah, that thing about taking on different hats, maybe even in undergrad and grad school, you're not even taught how to be an artist <laughs> necessarily. So yeah. if these other things I'm doing, like I don't know how to be on a fledgling board or even like these other um, kind of commissions. Um, you know, I, when I was on the Denver Commission on Cultural Affairs, which was, it, it is an incredible, you're a liaison between your community and essentially the City Council of Denver, which is super important. Um, Denver does have some really great programs for, for arts and, and the City Council people understand that it needs to be in their communities and in their districts. And um, But going on to that board at the time, I was kind of in a transition area where I felt like most of the people were like lawyers, developers, and people with more of a business sense who like definitely appreciated art, which was great, but there weren't a lot of artists. And I had, I learned an incredible amount from those people, like just language of business and like yep. city government and civic, like they use an entirely different language than I, than I knew at that time. And so not only is it like part of the practice of, of being a steward and kind of being a liaison, I learned from those experiences. Yeah. Um, Tilt West, I've been fortunate to be on um, from Sarah McKenzie from the beginning, and um, and uh, and you know they kind of started that on their own, and like we didn't know how to start a working board. We, they'd been on boards, so it's like to form something in itself um, was a really amazing um, thing. And and most of the all the kind of nonprofit boards that I've been on have really been about like literally getting out into the community and interacting with artists and kind of culture. Tilt West is an organization where we uh, host round table conversations around art and culture topics. Um, some of them happen online and some happen in the real. It's not hierarchical. We just get 30 people in a room with a prompt and we talk about whatever the conversation goes. There's no moderator. Um, anybody can kind of speak at any time and they've been 
uh, we're in our fifth season and it's been incredibly fruitful to um, be a part of those conversations, but also um, just be a part of, uh, again, a nonprofit and Union Hall. What an incredible introduction for uh, the space is kind of like, doesn't seem like it would be inviting in some ways, but um, mm -hmm. Union Hall has invited the, the Rough Gems program, which many CU students have participated in, the curatorial aspect of it, um, has invited, if encouraged, if not pushed, students from Boulder to do something in Denver and show up. So I've actually gotten to meet all the people who've curated exhibitions there because I'm on the board now and I've been going to the openings for a while and showing up to those. And, and um, that integration is extremely important to me and I want to be involved with, with um, organizations that make those, that kind of impact. Fantastic. And, you know, I think I, I, I feel like from your, your presentation and everything that you've done in the past in terms of bringing people together, there's that thread of breaking down the hierarchy. It's the thread of being welcoming. I, I mean, your deep crit series is just, it's so lovely because I know, I know a lot of artists that are really, really accomplished and, and doing their work that didn't get the MFA, didn't even get the BFA. And they, there's always a place they feel like, ah, oh, you know, where am I? And those kind, that, that particular program and, you know, how you invite people to shows and different things. It's just, it's just this beautiful non-hierarchical way that, that could be and should be applied to everything we do as, as humans. And it would just be so much more compelling and opening you know, opening up doors for everybody, which Derek, you do constantly and just can't thank you enough for sharing what you did today. And we'll, like I said, continue in the next days, but it's just, it's just the most hopeful way of living a creative life in every way possible. And um, we really feel honored to be able to interact and, and have you in our, our company. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, thank and, you for yeah. having me and allowing me to hopefully kind of like invigorate or just hopefully spread that energy a little bit. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight and know of course that um, Derek's talk and all of the talks in our series and also the Visiting Artists and Scholars series can be found on YouTube and also on the Art and Art History website. And um, we look forward to our last guest, which will be Jess Larson on April 5th, same time, 6.30. Jess is a um, former MFA grad at CU and now teaches at the University of Minnesota in Morris. So we'll continue with this incredible banter about how to live that creative life. So thank you again, Derek, and thank you everybody for joining this evening.